Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So we're here today with a very distinguished panel. We're going to talk about the state of American retirement by navigating the gender balance. Um, so we're from all the issues that we have with um, women in retirement, we're going to talk about what the issues are, how we got there, and then we want to hopefully talk about some solutions. So if we can start out just um, the introduction of the panel, can we, can we go from the side of the room just so sort of say who you are and where you're from? And okay. <laughs> I'm uh, Cindy Levering. I'm a retired pension actuary consultant. I've been retired six years now and spent uh, over 30 years in the pension actuarial business. Um, I am now um, living in Baltimore, although it took me like two hours to get here, so it's um, so you think of both of easier to get here than that. Um, and doing a lot of volunteer work with the Society of Actuaries. Uh, we do a, a lot of different projects on retirement risks and needs, and we do um, actually do some things that focus specifically on women. So, uh, and hello, I'm Cheryl Phillips. I'm kind of the square peg in the round holes here, um, and I do not have a financial background. I'm a geriatric physician, <clears throat> and that's my clinical background. My current role is I'm Senior Vice President for Public Policy and Health Services for Leading Age, and Leading Age is a national association of nonprofit aging service providers across the continuum. And I'm Susan Jennings. I'm the Executive which is a group that's promoting uh, annuities as a retirement alternative. And my day job is I'm um, senior counsel at National Life Group. Uh, National Life Group is the number one provider of indexed annuities in the educational retirement space. And hi, my name is Kathy Stokes. I'm with the Women's Institute for Secure Retirement, WISER. And if you're not familiar with WISER, I um, recommend you go to wiserwomen.org. We have lots of great, useful, non-biased information for moderate and low-income women mostly on uh, helping them understand the challenges they face when it comes to retirement security and helping them figure out how to avoid poverty in retirement. And I'm Rodney Brooks. I'm retirement colleagues for the Washington Post. Well, let's start out talking about some of the challenges facing women in retirement. Uh, and because we'll talk about some of the challenges and talk about why why we have those challenges, and first of all, we'll talk about maybe some of the solutions. So um, let's start talking, Kathy, you know, let's, what, what are some of the, the challenges we face in well, retirement, preparing for retirement? The challenges they face in retirement come from the challenges that women face in, in their pre-retirement years, right? Um, we earn somewhere around 77 or 78 cents on the dollar that men earn, so we have less opportunity to save. Women tend to work in um, jobs where retirement benefits aren't offered, tend more often than not, or than men, to work part-time, and part-time typically doesn't come with 401k or defined benefit coverage. Um, also, women live longer than men do by somewhere around three or four years, and so they need money to last longer in retirement. So they have less money going in, but they need more money when they're there. And as primary caregivers, women tend to take time out of the workforce where they don't have uh, an opportunity to save for retirement, or at least not a meaningful opportunity to save for retirement. And the average time that women spend out of the workforce is 13 years. And that's a lot of lost 401k uh, opportunity or divine benefit to the degree that's still there. And it's also zeros in the calculation for your social security benefit. So all of these things come together to really create a challenge for women. Okay, um, Cindy and um, so can we talk about longevity, the issue with longevity, either one of you? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, obviously the actuarial tables show that women do tend to, to live longer, and that means they're living longer at older ages and potentially more likely to need long-term care or medical care and, um, and things like that, and maybe not have the family caregivers. They may have been the family caregiver, but um, you know, when, when it comes to time when they need it, there may not be the caregivers there uh, available to, uh, to provide the care that they need, so they're having to, to pay for that um, care. Uh, I think the other thing is that, um, if, especially for married women, 
a lot of planning is done as a couple and not necessarily thinking about what would potentially happen to either, either survivor, but it's more likely to be the woman who is the survivor of the couple and to plan for that. Uh, and I'll build a little bit on, on both what Kathy and Cindy said. Indeed, women are more likely to be caregivers when we think about um, children and child rearing, but they're also more likely to be caregivers of their spouse. And if their spouse is older, which has been a normative trend, uh, they're more likely to be at the end of their working years at a time when they could be actively saving and now they are caregiving for a spouse. And the issue with longevity, while we celebrate uh, long life, sometimes, and it doesn't mean that age is a disease, but women are more likely to be burdened by functional limitations. That means the kinds of things that they need to support their activities of daily living. So as they get older, um, 80 plus, they are more than 50% likely to need support in one of those activities of daily living, cooking for themselves, cleaning the house, managing their bills. Rarely have they anticipated that in their financial planning if they've thought about medical costs, it's usually health benefits. Rarely do we think about what is it going to take to support me in sometimes 15 years after I turn 80 and who's going to do that and who's going to pay for it. So what's it going to take for us to start thinking about that? I think there's probably um, three prongs. One is investment in health when we're young. So you know, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. So when I'm a doctor, I'll have to do my health part. And our time to think about health and function and act being active is when we're younger, not waiting until we're 80. But um, another challenge for our individuals is planning for what kinds of support needs might I need. Now, most caregiver support still comes from the family, either a daughter or a daughter-in-law. So hope your sons marry well if you don't have daughters. <laughs> but that's not necessarily a good long-term plan. So how do you plan for support needs without the assumption that Medicare pays for it because it doesn't? And Medicaid is often not an option for long-term support needs. So um, being investing in your health when you're young, anticipating your long-term needs, and then the third piece of what we do as a country. And we have to start thinking about how are we going to pay for long-term services and supports, the kinds of things that people need to live, not in nursing homes and not in hospitals, but live where they call home into their older years. And we, as a country, individually we haven't prepared well. As a country, we also haven't prepared well. Um, Susan, what, so one of the issues is, um, and um, talk to a lot of financial planners, okay, is one of the issues is women tend to put themselves last and put family first, okay. So what kind of advice do you have in that regard? Well, I think women need to start thinking about financial planning even when they're very young. Um, just the choice of whether or not to take out loan for college. This starts a whole trend that goes over a lifetime. So if you're burdened with a lot of student debt, and perhaps you could have waited and gone to grad school and while you were working and had it paid for, but if you choose to take the student loan route, that decision carries forward with you for a very long time. So we need to start talking about financial planning with teenagers, because these are lifelong decisions. And then with women, it's not so unusual to continue that through their lifetime. So I see a lot of divorce decrees, because people are um, dividing insurance and retirement benefits. And so many times the woman is fighting for the child care assistance, but not fighting to get half of her husband's retirement plan. So yes, we need to have much more conversation with women about the total financial package and not just the immediate needs that they are of course concerned about, but they depend on long-term also. Okay, so okay, you mentioned divorce, okay, so um, besides, besides women in the long term, okay, we know we have a fairly high divorce rate, um, um, increasing the need of baby boomers. So, how much of an issue is that now? Now, anyone can answer. Yeah, divorce is a significant issue. Um, a, a lot of people don't understand that um, you can get Social Security benefits from your spouse, and as long as you live, as long as you were married for ten years, but the average first marriage ends at eight. 
So the benefit just goes away. And during the divorce process, just like Susan was saying, women tend to focus on the here and the now and not on those pension benefits. And often a lawyer who's writing up the divorce decree doesn't know that they need something called a qualified domestic relations order to make that money available to the divorcing spouse um, when retirement comes around. So it's a big uh, gap in information and understanding. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I just wanted to um, add a question. Because I think also if you get, even if you do qualify for your ex husband's social security, if you get remarried, you could lose that. Um, so it's, I think the whole social security claiming procedure and rules are so complicated that everybody really needs to be familiar with them. Not just as an individual, but also as a couple and, you know, maybe not as a, as a different couple, potentially. But I mean, I think it's really worth everyone's while to spend the time to learn those. And it's not just Social Security, but there are veterans benefits also, and those are also available for spouses. So I think when um, people try to attack the financial plan, even if you um, have a more modest income, you really need to have a professional advisor. And many times, people like uh, financial planners or insurance agents have a background in this, and at least the red flag will go up to say, have you looked into veterans benefits that might be available for long-term care for a spouse? Um, it's just too bad that this money lays on ground for people who really need it, and they don't even know to pick it up. Okay, so let's talk about two things, OK? What, what, what kind of advice would you have for younger women, and there's a hesitancy to talk to financial planners to get that kind of help. Um, how do you encourage the younger women um, to start doing that? And to that, we're going to talk about what we're going to, um, what kind of advice we have for people who are older and haven't really saved a lot for, for retirement. So let's start with the younger women, and why why is there that reluctance to get the financial help, um, and and that's just generally true for people in general. Okay. Well, if I can jump in here, because I think that financial literacy is a problem of both genders, but I think women are particularly at risk of not having at a younger age the financial knowledge base of how to navigate the waters. And so when I see older women in my practice. Um, it's not unusual for them to say, my husband just recently died. I don't even know how to pay checks. I don't know where the bills are. I don't know. Where do I find? How do I? And the idea of just basic core financial literacy at an early age is where I would start in the counseling of women. And, okay, stick with that for a minute. Okay, so how do we start that? We encourage students to, to start, how do you start that interest in financial literacy? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the Index Community Leadership Council did a survey of millennials. You can go to their website and see it. 37% um, of millennials, now you're talking up in children in their 30s, have started no safe for retirement, men and women. And you can believe that women are probably even higher in that number. Um, and so I really think it starts uh, in the workplace, in college, when you have a 401k plan, many times the benefit committee comes in and tells you, oh, you have a 401k plan, and women turn to their neighbor and say, oh, what are you investing in? Um, and that's the end of the conversation. But at cocktail parties and that kind of social event, men tend to say more about investing, and they talk about investing, um, what kind of loan rate they got on their mortgage. So it just has to get more into the young women's consciousness. And I have three daughters in that millennial adult age. And I'm constantly trying to uh, educate them. And I think we as older women need to pass this on and say, this is something you need to talk about now when you're in your 20s. Yeah, I'm talking with um, patients. And one of the things that's important for physicians to have conversations with patients about their plans for life, advanced care planning, their wishes, who they expect to take care of them. How do they expect to pay for it is often a question that isn't included. And I think that health professionals have an opportunity. As you talk about you know, health and wellness going forward, health and wellness also includes the ability to provide for yourself and to provide the support that you anticipate or don't anticipate that you might need in the future. So that's another opportunity. Yeah, I think to take advantage of, I mean, if you are at a 
uh, come to the office of 401k, they are providing educational material to you. And you owe it to yourself to really take it. I mean, take the responsibility to learn about it. I mean, you don't have to become an expert overnight, but take the time. And, and one of the things we found in a lot of our research is people have very short planning horizons. They're not looking out more generally more than 10 years. Um, and I mean, I know it's hard at, you know, at age 30 to look out 30 or 40 years, but you know, kind of do it in, in stages. And uh, don't let it all go until you're in your 50s where it's really difficult, if not impossible, to, to uh, make it work. I mean, I think just, just being comfortable with it and, and learning and, and uh, taking advantage of all the resources that are available. You know, as a society, we spend more time planning our two-week vacation than we do planning for retirement. And so a um, big piece of advice from, from Wiser would be to make a plan, figure out what it is going to cost. There are hundreds of calculators, maybe there's too many, and it gets, you get to analysis paralysis, but if you go to just about any uh, free calculator on, on the internet, you can come up with a retirement goal, and then it's a matter of figuring out how you're going to get there. The other thing that we need to really be aware of is that as they get into those middle and older years and their kids are growing up, all of a sudden their 401k plan or their IRA looks uh, like a really nice opportunity to pay for the wedding or to pay for you know, the first grandchild bedroom or something like that. And that money needs to stay in the system. I think the bottom line is fund your retirement first. There are generally other resources available for other things like education and things like that. And I just want to add that um, we have done some studies about when women start and if they start saving right away, even if they leave the workplace to do family leave and then later come back, um, they get so much more money by starting early, even if it's in modest amounts, than the person who waits till their mid-40s or 40s. You just cannot catch up. Even by starting young, stopping, and then going back, you will do far better. Far better. <laughs> okay, so okay, and about the financial planning industry, okay, do they need to do more outreach? I, I think they do. I mean, uh, generally, they're looking for people with larger amounts of money to manage, um, and so you have to be careful. I mean, if it's a you know, look at whether it's a fee for service or a commission based, and um, but there are a lot of things available online. There's a lot. There's some new models that are being worked on in terms of how to provide this on a more cost-effective basis for both parties involved. So the education market that we're in, the K through 12 um, school market, people there buy these products to supplement their state retirement plans individually. So you have more opportunities to meet with an agent because that agent is providing that um, investment for you, whether it's an annuity or mutual funds. However, in the 401k world, you don't have people who are counselors coming in and speaking to people one-on-one. -on -one. So I would really like to see more companies provide individual financial planning with agents or financial planners to their workers. And that would be a really good step because many times you're in a room like this and you're hearing a presentation about these funds and no one's talking to you about the fact, well, maybe your husband loves the stock markets, putting everything there, and you need a more conservative philosophy like an annuity. You shouldn't be in the mutual funds because the other half of your financial picture is doing that. So. Uh, I saw a survey that said um, millennial women were um, more financially savvy, and one of the reasons was um, they do online banking. They use apps, okay? Is, is that going to be a solution for older women? Um, um, what what other kinds of things can we could we talk we talked about calculators and um, but, um, there are a lot of them and, and uh, it does take some so it, some of them are kind of intimidating so so are there things like apps that might help older women um, uh, with their finances? There are many senior centers and. Um, the area agencies on aging in each state have resources for older people of both genders, but particularly for women. While they may be a little timid to um, explore an app, they may be willing to sit down with a counselor who can translate it into understandable language. Um, 
The other thing that women, older women, are starting to do more, we have always been, individuals have been rather private about our financial affairs, and we tend not to sit down with our kids and go over our retirement plans with our kids. But again, another area that I counsel older women is to sit down with your children, lay out your retirement plan, talk to them. Even if you're not comfortable using an app, they may be. So looking for the resources that can help you coach. I think too, people don't realize that there are financial um, resources available to them in places like their churches. Um, a lot of churches have financial planning workshops available, um, and maybe you are a member of uh, an investment club. Some women might get together and do investment clubs where they use real money or make believe money that it's a game. Um, but there are resources available to you besides apps um, that you might, in places you might not. That's an important uh, point. Uh, I'm, I know Wiser, we work with a lot of organizations across the country, whether it's church groups or other community organizations, to bring financial education to women to their communities. There is a trust issue in the financial planning world, and if you can bring information to women uh, through a trusted source, a trusted resource, then you're going to get familiar with that. Oh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a column in the Washington Post what to do if you're 50 and you haven't saved for retirement and it has to be the most popular column I've ever written. <laughs> so let's talk about women, uh, women who are already in their 50s and 60s and okay, and all of a sudden realize, okay, I, I haven't saved enough for retirement. Um, what kind of choices and alternatives do they have? Okay. Anybody? Okay. I think you just started. <laughs> right away. <laughs> I mean, just get started. You know, sometimes it's just the iner get know the inertia and just just you know get something going. Um, and maybe you're going to have to adjust the age at which you would plan to retire. I mean, we find that um, retirees tend to you know retire at an earlier age than pre-retirees think they're going to. I mean, people get to a certain age and they'll you know they think well you know before that they'll think well I'm going to work till 65 or 70. And then they get to 60 and, you know, something may be going at their job that they're not, not happy with or whatever, and they just pack it in. Um, so I think you really have to look very carefully at that and decide, you know, working several years long could make a big difference for you. Start being really nice to your daughter in law. <laughs> uh, again, I'll go back to that. And this is also an important time to address two pervasive myths about um, health care and long-term supportive care as we get older. If I ask most 50-year-old women, if you need long-term care, how is that paid for? The number one myth is that Medicare will pay for it. And Medicare does not. Medicare pays for very limited, skilled services, but most people, particularly older women, when you talk to them about, and now that I'm in my 50s, I can say older women, um, that when you talk to them about their future needs of long-term care, the assumption is Medicare will pay for it if they know. The second is that, well, if Medicare won't pay for it, Medicaid will. And there are very strict rules about eligibility and state budgets that are rapidly shrinking. So we can't assume that Medicaid is the safety net. So another thing I would do for 50-year-olds is remind them of those myths and start to talk about what their long-term care plans are for care, and again, be nice to their daughter-in-law. And I think, too, I'm sorry, I was just going to say I agree with uh, not only daughter-in-laws, but I would <laughs> sit down with the family um, and assess what the financial picture is. Because if you are um, in a position where you're going to have to rely on your children, then your children deserve to know that and they know to start planning for that ahead of time. Um, also, I think that you need to educate yourself to those government programs that we've talked about, um, Social Security, Veterans Administration benefits, because sometimes you can, how you collect on Social Security, um, you can get more earlier and time it, but it takes someone helping you, unless you're yourself an expert in Social Security, um, to maximize those kinds of uh, benefits and then as far as uh, working into retirement, I think that um, you need to keep yourself healthy. Um, you need to uh, look at your financial picture and think about, can I defer any income? Uh, what options do I have at my office or my job to maximize my retirement? 
And these people who are entrepreneurs now, um, they need to look at different types of plans, not just IRAs, because you can't put that much aside. You might need to do a more sophisticated plan, like a 401k yourself, which you can do to maximize the tax leverage of um, saving for retirement. Because if you save a dollar, you're really saving uh, for the 30% tax bracket, you're really saving a dollar 33 or five. Um, because you're saving the tax besides the money you put in. So make sure you understand all those little nuances um, because they can add up to more money. Yeah, one of those nuances gets to the Social Security claiming age. Um, a, a lot of times people end up deciding to take Social Security as soon as they can get it at age 62. But if you do that, you can lose as much as 25% of your benefit. Um, but if you wait longer past your normal retirement age, you can increase that benefit by 8% a year up until the age of 70. And that can really be meaningful to a lot of women. Social Security lasts as long as you do. And there aren't that many resources out there that do that. So, But there are, and women can educate themselves on what lifetime income options are out there that can sort of mimic Social Security and connect to it so that they have money that lasts as long as they do. I wanted to add to what Susan said about keeping yourself healthy. Healthy also keeping your skills up to date. Okay. And just go back and talk about the issues of, oh, okay, when you put in your sales person, uh, okay, when we talked about uh, caring for spouses or relatives, uh, women tend to be the ones to do that. Um, and you know, the issue is, um, the kids keep coming back home. <laughs> and, and we love our kids. Okay? And it's hard to say, you know, um, put yourself first and come to them. So what, what kind of choices? I mean, how do you make those hard decisions? Are you going to start caring? Yeah, well, when, when, when our children come back home, and sometimes they do, it doesn't mean that they can come back and just uh, assume their old position in the family. They need to be able to contribute as well. You can't be using your own retirement money to pay for your, for your kid who may or may not want to work or can't find a job. Get any job and contribute to the family, is what I would say. And I think now we're in a culture where we don't know how to do without. Um, you know, we take for We have to have internet. We have to have cable. We have to have a newer vehicle. Uh, and we have to have two of those. Uh, and I think it's time to start exercising some physical responsibility. Um, you know, I grew up hearing from my grandparents about what they lost in the Depression, and that stayed with me for a very long time. And a calculator was my friend at the grocery store because um, I didn't have a lot of money, and I had to budget, and I had to know how much I was spending on food. So we are doing our kids a disservice um, if we don't teach them these kinds of things, too, to, that everything isn't instant like the millennials want. Um, it's something that you earn over time. There's another cost to caregiving in addition to the financial cost, but it has financial implications. Um, women who are late life caregivers tend to disregard their own health. So they are more likely to be depressed. They are more likely to have unmet medical needs with the chronic conditions, chronic conditions, things like arthritis, hypertension, things that don't just get better on their own. And so at the end of their caregiving experience, their spouse may die, the partner, person that they were caring for, now they are burdened with much more medical challenges and much more risk of frailty, and now putting themselves at risk for increased cost demands, frankly, into their retirement years. So not only is there financial cost, there's a health cost often. So another area of counseling is when you are a caregiver, making sure that you're attending to your own spiritual, mental, social, and physical health needs. Oh, because that's a good investment for you in the future. Okay, and some ways to do that? I mean, support groups, how do you, I mean, what do you, what kind of help can you see? Number one, staying physically active. And I won't make this um, a, you know, a health lecture, but at any age, at any age, even in the 70s and 80s, the best way to stave off functional limitations and higher care needs is to remain physically active. Be socially engaged, support group, church group, volunteer at a pet shelter, stay socially connected outside of yourself. And um, our focus on nutrition, and particularly for 
women in lower socioeconomic groups, we don't think about food challenges in older women, but it is very, very, very real. And so having access to adequate and safe and reliable nutrition, being physically active, and staying socially engaged are probably the three fundamental things that we can do to maintain that. Any, anything else on this? Uh, yeah. um, no, I think I agree with, with what everyone said. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think children just have to be held accountable to uh, do their fair share, too, and maybe, you know, sitting down with them and having the discussion of, you know, look, I'm not going to be able to retire in, you know, in any time in the near future if, you know, if it, we continue on. So everybody's on the same page. Okay, well, while we were in the talk with the children, let's talk about college tuition. Because it's a question I get a lot. Um, should I, um, you know, save for retirement or or pay my child's tuition? And, and then, then there's a choice people have made the times pulling tuition money out of their retirement. Okay, so what, what kind of advice do you have for women when it comes to making these kinds of choices? Raise your hand if you've heard of a loan for <laughs> retirement or <laughs> a scholarship by any chance. You can't get a loan or a scholarship for retirement income. You've got to focus on your retirement income security. Your kids have other options. There, there are loans as, as difficult as they may be. But it's more important for you and for the health of your future and your children's future that you have the money you need to uh, to retire on. And I think too that uh, you have to look very hard at and be very frank about where they're going to college, what their major is. Um, I think it's very sad to see people coming out with these six-figure student loans, and they've gone to a college that perhaps does not have a very good job placement record. Um, their degree is in a major that is not marketable. Um, and there they are with this loan that is going to saddle them for 25 years. Um, and so as a parent, I think it's important to guide them realistically as to what their expectations are. And maybe it's not fun, maybe it's not what their friends are doing, but maybe you should go to a community college for two years and save that money and go to the four-year school You know, after that, or work part-time and or full time and go to school um, at night and let your employer pay part of it. There are other options besides asking mom and dad. Um, and I just want to say, make sure I have a chance to say it, that when people look at the accumulation value of what they have in their retirement funds, I think it's more realistic to look at what that will turn into as far as income, because it might look like a large number when you're looking at your 401k, and you say, oh, I have $100,000. But if you're retiring at 65, and you're the expert, but your life expectancy is 85, you don't even have to think about interest. Divide 20 into 100,000, that's not what you were planning on living on. So when you look at giving money to your children, think about not how much money's there, but what that will generate in income. And it'll probably be sticker shock. And translating to care needs, if you need full-time, long-term care, you can plan on eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a year in costs. And again, Medicare doesn't pay for it. Medicaid, only in certain circumstances, pay, pays for it. So you may think that you're in a really good place with one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and then you offer your um, child's uh, college education, and now you're in a very, very risky place. And I do have to laugh a little bit because I had a conversation with a close friend whose daughter wanted to use her retirement, her mother's retirement plan for a master's degree in French literature. And I am sure that that is a wonderful uh, degree, and she's a charming young lady, and I'm trying to think, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do with French literature? That's a good point. Yeah, and, and I agree with what everyone said, and, and as, uh, there are obviously other options to look at besides tapping into your retirement. I mean, people retiring with debt is, not a good thing. I mean, it's, you know, if your resources are streamed anyway, and on top of it, you've got debt, student loan debt, or home equity debt, or anything like that, um, it's just going to make it all that much more challenging. And the, the one thing I wanted to add to, uh, when we talk about what Medicare doesn't pay, also doesn't pay for prescription drugs, unless you get a supplement. So, um, yeah. the Scan Foundation in California did a, a 
survey, focus group survey, looking at a large number of uh, retirees in California. And there were only about one third had set aside enough money for long-term care services. And of that, the majority of those would not have finances to pay for more than six months. So when we talk about funding our own long-term care needs, we're talking about a very small percentage of people going into retirement right now that are prepared for that. And as we're talking about, women will live longer, they are usually more likely to live alone, and they're more likely to have chronic condition needs because they're living longer. Um, we are not prepared now, and unless we change the younger generation, they're not going to be any more prepared going into the retirement years for long-term care support. Okay, let's stay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I will say, we recently done some focus groups of both um, newer retired, people who have been retired less than 10 years. We just did some people who have been retired more than 10 years. And uh, for the, the longer retired group, I must say, and again, these are, this is just a small group, a small, very small sample, but we did uh, focus groups both in the United States and in different cities in Canada. Retirees are amazingly resilient, and um, they're, uh, the people that we had in focus groups were able to adjust their spending to match their income. Now, whether that's something that will continue in the future, uh, but we were really struck at how resilient they, they were and um, you know, how well they were managing. And, um, so, uh, you know, I, the, while I'm not saying that that means people shouldn't worry about it or plan for it, um, you know, I, that was encouraging to me. Okay, then, so let's stay with health care for a minute. Okay, sure, you talk about long term care. Okay, but because of the longevity issues, okay, people in retirement, um, and especially women, have higher health care costs okay, as well. Um, so you have all these things you have to deal with. Okay, you have to worry about long term care, but you also have to worry about taking care of your health in general. Okay, so just some solutions here. Uh, you know, you have to, uh, those costs can be. You know, so hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, if during the course of retirement, those were most surveys I see, I see say a couple going to cost at least a quarter million dollars. You know, during the course of retirement, okay, and and because you know, when you're longer, the issue, you know, is more pronounced. I continue to see women who have never paid into Medicare, um, who for a variety of reasons. Either they were domestic workers and didn't have Medicare withdrawn. A number of reasons. Going into your retirement years without having a Medicare, either from your spouse or from your own earnings, is a very risky place. The other thing is to assume that Medicare in and of itself will cover everything. While Medicare is an important and vital safety net for older Americans, it pays about 80 percent. There are large areas of deductible, including um, the drug benefits that aren't often talked about. So assuming that my health care will be covered when I get older because I am old and therefore I have Medicare is another opportunity. So we don't often think of our physicians as being our financial planners. But when I'm talking with women that are approaching Medicare age, what are they what are they using and planning for um, the secondary Medicare or stop the gap insurance to cover the deductibles? Have they thought about the drug plans? Um, what are their current medication needs? How expensive are those likely to be in the future? Um, because investing in your health plan coverage is also incredibly important because we know that our, the number one reason for bankruptcy in this country, and I certainly would look to the experts here, are health care costs. So if you go into your retirement and you have minimal assets and you have not planned for your health care costs, then you've added yet another looming risk into the many years that you have going forward. Another piece of the, the again, it's not covered by Medicare, is dental costs, and which can be substantial. And we found some of that in our focus groups where people had thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of, med of dental costs. Um, so that's another of the, the puzzle. And I would just like people to also look at their life insurance and their annuity products. Uh, a lot of these policies nowadays uh, have health 
health insurance or uh, long-term care type provisions. So you can, although that's not health insurance and it's not long-term care insurance, you can get enhanced benefits on your annuities or enhanced benefits on your um, life insurance. If it's a catastrophic illness, you might even be able to tap into some of those proceeds. So again, look at what you've already bought and see what special items or features you may have on those kind of products that you've overlooked or forgotten about. And also on Medicare, every year there's an open enrollment period where you can um, revise the, the program that you're in. You can be in traditional Medicare, you can be in Medicare Advantage plan, you can choose from prescription drug plans, and not a lot of seniors take advantage of this open enrollment period. I think it's happening right now. It may have just started this week or even today. But from what I've heard, prescription drug costs are going up for, for the premium and for the individual drugs up by 13% this year. So it's really important that people understand that they're not just stuck in the plan that you started with. And again, if you're a veteran, there are benefits for prescriptions. And my own dad, who served uh, in the Korean War, was unaware of that. And the donut hole was beginning to be a big problem in the Medicare. And um, he realized that he could go to his local Veterans uh, Administration and get those drugs at a much reduced cost. So that has saved him a great deal of money. And the donut hole, for those of you that don't speak Medicare, the gap um, under the current Medicare drug plans or Part D plans, there's a coverage for a certain amount of money, and then when you spend a whole lot of money, there's coverage, but then there's this gap that is called donut hole. And one of the things, this is coming up to Thanksgiving, and one of the things that I would routinely counsel families on is this is Thanksgiving, it's time, maybe you haven't seen mom in a year. How is mom doing? What's her health situation? Does she have food in the house? Is she able to take care of herself? But it's also a great time to sit down after you clear off the table and talk about mom's financial health as well. What are our plans for next year, for 10 years, for 20 years? And you don't even have to wait until mom's in her 70s and you're going home and seeing her for Thanksgiving. It's a great thing to do with your family after Thanksgiving instead of the football game or the nap is to sit down and talk about what does the future look like financially, health-wise, what are our plans. Um, it's a great time because I think what we've all said consistently is this is a family solution. And older women who are often the caregivers, the supporters of others, get into their retirement years ill-prepared. Part of what we can do to anticipate that is make it a family solution earlier on. That's a great point, and also when you are visiting, look for signs that things aren't, you know, the bills are piling up, that things aren't being taken care of, uh, and maybe you can intervene before it doesn't have a problem. Okay, we're we'll coming to the end of our time, but um, I hope we can end with each one of you then um, say what kind of advice, okay, if you have one thing, okay, for women heading into retirement. Or even that one. What, what advice would you okay? Would you give someone um, who has known with the district law? Okay, can't you just start? You just go right on down. I have many pieces, but I think the biggest piece of advice is start saving young and save as much as you can. Um, uh, there's no one size fits all for how much you should be saving, but if you want to use a general rule when you're starting young, focus on 10 to 15 percent of your income, and if you have a 401k the match counts toward that 10 to 15 percent, so it's not as big of a climb as you might think. And the more you save when you're younger, the less difficult it's going to be to meet your goal when you're older. I think I would tell women to not be afraid. Don't be afraid about financial issues. This may not be your comfort zone, but it's your life. And you really need to get a grasp on this. So talk about it. Read about it. Look for information about it. Um, and don't hide behind your husband. Uh, don't hide behind your children. Be responsible for yourself. And uh, if you start that journey, uh, things will fall in place for you. I really believe that. And, and I would follow that in very similar advice of have the family conversation. The family conversation is about your family's health, but also your health, your anticipated long-term care needs, your financial health, and what the family plan is 
for going forward, including, uh, this is a good time to have that conversation about advanced care wishes, the kinds of things you would want. Do you want to live independently for as long as you can? What kind of resources would that take? So the, the family conversation needs to be a dynamic and fluid and ongoing process, and it's never too early to start. And I would agree with everything everyone has said. I mean, obviously, take responsibility for yourself. Start early. Um, plan, you know, to try to have a longer range plan. And maybe that changes over time. Sure. Um, so, you know, don't just plan to averages, especially as you get closer to retirement, because you have to assess your own risk tolerance and decide, you know, can I, can I really afford to, you know, to assume I'm only going to live to 85? Should I be planning to 95 or 100? Or... Um, so just you know, right, starting early and, and everything that everyone said. Well, thank you, uh, all of all of you panelists. I, I think it was a great. We did a great, great job here, and, and I want to thank the panelists. And, uh, thank you very much. And then I don't know if anybody had any questions, but we have a few minutes set aside for audience questions. So if anybody has any questions for the panelists, I think Jean has a question. Um, so one of the things that I'm thinking about lately, based on everything that I'm reading, is about a third of people of age 85 have some form of dementia or Alzheimer's. And to me, that's a scary idea because First of all, how do you serve people in that state of mind? And then how do you plan for that state of mind? And I don't think people are aware of the need around that plan. So if you have any. Well, my mother had Alzheimer's. And when I look back at my family, uh, of the grandmother in I can see one, one of my great grandmothers died in childbirth, but I can go back four generations of senility directly in my line. So I do worry about it. I haven't volunteered for the Alzheimer's gene test because it makes me nervous. But um, I think what you need to do is, again, think about what you're going to use for long-term care because that is going to be very important financially. And then the burden on the caregiver. Uh, it nearly killed my father, um, you know, because he kept my mother until three months before she passed. So um, again, it, it, when you get into this situation, and I thought that I discussed this with my mother and father um, about how we were going to handle it when my mother got that diagnosis. But it was so hard for my dad because they've been together since, um, you know, they were 16, boyfriend and girlfriend. So um, uh, with that on the horizon and, and it rising, the numbers of people rising, I don't think we see a medical cure, you know, on the horizon. I, we just have to think about what long-term care resources that we have available to us. And again, if there are things on your annuities, if you've used annuities to save for retirement to help with that, there are long-term care policies that you um, may get to buy. They're getting harder to get. The benefits are less. But um, you need to look at those alternatives. And actually, the numbers may even be a little bit greater. So not to be too gloom and doom here, um, persons who reach the age of 85 have about a 50% risk of having some cognitive impairment prior to the death. And that is often associated with long-term care costs. So that goes back to where I started um, in the earliest part of our conversation. Um, long-term services and supports are those things that you need to support you wherever you are living, and usually in the kinds of things like um, activities of daily living, support with even dressing or feeding yourself if you're uh, particularly impaired. And cognitive problems or dementia is the number one reason for needing long-term services and supports. And you can anticipate um, three to seven years of support needs. So that becomes part of the family conversation. It doesn't mean that we sit down and go, you know, I'm planning on being dented when I'm 82, so I'm not sure how you guys are going to work this out. But it becomes part of the conversation of what do we as a family anticipate my long-term service and supports needs may be? And how are we prepared to do that? And how are we prepared to pay for it? But the number one risk for cost in this country is absolutely Alzheimer's and related dementias. And there is, we talked about long-term care products. There also are annuity products 
that you buy at a younger age that don't start paying a uh, benefit until 80 or 85. And so the cost of those is much lower because you're buying at a younger age, but then the benefits would start when you're at the point where maybe your cognitive abilities aren't as good and you can't manage your money, and then you've got this stream of income that you can depend on. And I would just say that the Employee Benefit Research Institute um, recently did some research on what they call qualified longevity annuity contracts, which is this concept where you buy it when you're younger and it kicks in 15 or 20 years. It's uh, some pretty promising data on that. So. Um, just one brief observation and then a question. And the observation is, I think the family conversation is a great idea, but there are a lot of women out there who don't have families or close relationships with, with people and, and acknowledging their needs and doing something about them, some sort of planning, helping with that, I think is important. My question involves a topic that didn't come up, which is housing. And housing is both an expense and a resource. And I realize it's very difficult to get people thinking about reverse mortgages or selling their homes as, as a way of supplementing income. Um, but I think that's something that we've got to be thinking more about. And how do we enter that into the planning and the conversation about our um, longer term care and expense issues? So with our focus groups, what we found is, first of all, people want to stay in their house. And second of all, they don't want to have anything to do with reverse mortgages. And the one, the folks which we just did a couple months ago, somebody even said that they're a gimmick. And, you know, they're, they're right for some, some people. And, you know, I think that the difficult part is, is finding somebody who can help you navigate that whole area. Eliza <coughs> knows of a woman who took out a reverse mortgage. Um, her income was Social Security. And uh, she paid off her house. And she took out a reverse mortgage to pay off debt. She didn't think about it as a lifetime income source, where she could have set it up as monthly income for life. Um, she took it as a line of credit, and now she has nothing. She has her Social Security check, and I'm not saying that it's a bad idea for everybody, but there are other options to do. You know, I know people don't want to leave their homes, but maybe that's the option that they need to consider. Or bring in a roommate. I mean, there, there are other ways around it. This, um, I'm Sonia Kelly from the Center for Financial Inclusion. We talked a lot this morning about the responsibility that consumers have um, to, to be financially healthy and, and things that the individual can do. I'm wondering if you, if you can comment a bit on financial services providers and whether providers are beginning to see a business case for focusing specifically on women, targeting women, um, and, and what that might look like going forward in your work with financial services providers. So I'm with a financial service provider, and I'm smiling because we talk about women. Uh, when I first entered the workforce, which was in the late 1970s, so there's been a, a focus on women. Um, I think that women have been slow to pick up on um, financial information. Uh, they are now beginning to see the need for it, even the younger girls are. Um, our market, in a particular company, school teachers, is primarily um, women. But I think the main thing that people need to know about using a financial advisor is to pick an advisor that's right for them. So if um, you know you are with a financial advisor who really specializes in counseling high net worth people and you are a school teacher, that is not the right person. Um, you're not going to be high on their interest totem pole. Um, so you want to find a person who specializes in your uh, net worth kind of area. Um, it may be an insurance agent who just works on commission that you're not paying by the hour um, and has more background information on the resources available to you versus a planner who's perhaps trying to help people with their estate plan um, to minimize taxes on their retirement. That not, might not be the right advisor. So how do you find someone like that? Like how do you find a good doctor? How do you find a good lawyer? Uh, you need to get references. You need to look into the background of the person involved whether they're licensed with the SEC and FINRA, or they're licensed with the Insurance Commission, you can see their record, whether they've had any complaints against them. Um, you know, do your diligence like you would on any other person that you seek advice from, and find the right person who meets your needs. We don't go to a cardiologist, um, you know, when you're trying to have a baby. Um, you get the right person that meets what you're looking for. Something to answer that question? 
Um, no, I think that pretty much says it. Good. I think there are resources. The Water Zone has lots of resources on their website. The Society of Actuaries has a series of 11 decision briefs that we've done that are short pieces, um, less than 10 pages generally, that kind of give you, and there's one that focuses just on women, um, that give you a snapshot of things you should be thinking about and give you resources to go to to find out more information. They're written for not only consumers, but financial planners as well. And they're, they're very accessible, and they're actually, uh, I have them with me today if anybody would like to take a look at them, but they're on uh, the uh, Society of Equities website. Not someplace you would think of going to for, um, you know, easy to, to navigate material, but we do have some really good things out there. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.